of a series called Worth It. Sam Carey made the graphic. She's awesome. And for Worth It, we were talking about how, because of the importance of continuity, how it fit with the year's theme of the divine pursuit, where we know that God pursued us first, that it wasn't your bright idea or your great righteousness that led you to say, I must pursue the most high God, but instead that he pursued you and that you were smart enough to respond, right? Funny story um, is that I remember going to the 700 shop in town years ago, and I remember uh, wanting to buy a tie uh, for a choir concert that I was a part of. And this, this choir, Voices of Joy, was always so snazzy. They always wore the same color. They tried to coordinate. And so I needed to buy this tie that was going to allow me to coordinate with everybody. And it just so happened that I get into this conversation, truly random, where the person said, hey, I heard you say in the store that you were about to sing with a choir and that you're a Christian. So I want to know, are you a Calvinist or a Wesleyan? Never heard of that before. Didn't know what this dude was talking about. Don't know nothing about John Calvin at this point in my walk. Don't know nothing about John Wesley. The fact that they were both Johns is funny to me. I don't know nothing about these guys or their core tenets. I didn't know anything about choice versus predestination, Arminian versus Calvinist. I didn't know how serious this debate was. And he asked me that, and I said, all right, break it down to me, brother. What are you talking about? And he explained it. He kind of gave me this summary, and then I said, okay, so what you're saying is you want me to choose between whether I chose him or he chose me? Is that what you want? He was like, yeah. What is it? I go, I don't know. But whoever chose, they chose right, baby. <laughs> I now know that he pursued me first. I now know that I have a responsibility to respond to his pursuit. I now know that this pursuit is ongoing, and it doesn't just stop with me saying, crying at an altar, Lord, please come into my life. Like it happens at many Christian conferences for young college students and young adults, I now know that it's a daily thing, best likened to marriage in that I want to constantly know my spouse, and she wants to constantly know me. And Judah gave this picture in the last series in Hidden Treasure about how he wants to make sure he is communicating with his wife on a regular basis, not out of fear that he would get in trouble for not communicating with her, but because he loves her so greatly, he doesn't want to disappoint her because he doesn't want to break the person whose heart he has and she has his. He doesn't want to break her heart. So he spends time with her. He connects with her. He fellowships with her because he wants to make sure they are in lockstep. And that is a picture of what I want to have with God. So all year, all the teaching series have been about this divine pursuit. And some of them have leaned a little bit more heavy on God pursuing us. And some of them have leaned a little bit more heavy on us pursuing him. But all the, all the same, we are in this dance of him taking steps towards me and me taking steps towards him. And him taking steps towards you and you taking steps towards him. You savvy? We're good? All right, cool. So that's the divine pursuit. And we talked about how worth it connected with the previous series, because we don't just want continuity with the year. We want continuity with what was just taught. And so we built on the fact that for me to have this hidden treasure, this, this deep understanding of my spouse, the Lord, my husbandman, the Lord, my king, the Lord, I must pursue him. And we're not just talking about, uh, I show up to church every Sunday, Donovan, so I'm pursuing. We're not just talking about a version Bible plan, though those are amazing. And I thought Bree alluded to one earlier, and so I, I using that app. And so I'm not saying tools are bad, but that we can't say that the tool alone, the daily use of that, or the weekly attendance at church, or the I'm at a life group now that starts on September 20th, shameless plug. I'm going to be going to a life group. So Donovan, I have a relationship with God by virtue of that alone, that ain't cutting it. Those are methods by which I could pursue him to gain a deeper understanding, but I don't get it under, I don't get, I don't get this thought in my mind that 
I know enough about God so I can stop now. But instead, I say, I love him so much that I want to continue to seek after him. And when I do, he gives me another nugget about him. He gives me a fresh understanding. I grow in deeper love with him because every time I pursue him, he says, hey, son, hey, daughter, I want to give you just a little bit more of me. Something you may have not been ready to handle before, but you're ready for it now. Something that might have blew your mind before, but right now, I think, you, I think you're ready for this. Let me give you just a little bit more. And he invites us in a little bit closer. And every time he invites me in closer and I respond well, he's going to invite me in closer. And it keeps happening because I don't just want to know a little bit about my first love. I want to know everything about my first love. He already knows everything about me. But now I'm searching him. And this search matters. And so in Worth It, we talk about how in that pursuit of him, sometimes bad stuff happens. And in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, which, media team, we can pull that up, we talk about these bad things using the word trials. So it says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So let's linger on trials for a moment by way of review. When we talked about it last week, I told you that trials could be seen as tests. And these tests do not always feel so pleasant. In fact, these tests might even be so difficult that you might say that the pursuit of God, the pursuit of this deeper knowledge and relationship with him is not worth it. That'd be a lie. And it's one that Satan is really hoping you buy into. But understand that he is always worth it. And James is saying, despite these trials that could consume our attention, our day, our focus, despite how mag the magnitude of these trials, these trials are doing something in our favor if we pay attention. See, because in verse 3 it says, these trials are producing or the first, they're testing our faith, and then they're producing an endurance. And we talked about how endurance is a little bit different than strength, because strength would be me getting under a bench press. You all are familiar. I'm not going to lay down on the ground. But me getting on a bench press, me putting plates right on a barbell, or me using a machine that has like the little hook and it has like the little plates on the rack. And either way, I'm putting a resistance on this barbell or on myself, and I'm pressing down, letting gravity take the weight to my chest, and then I'm pressing back up. And oftentimes when you see that exercise demonstrated, you see it with a lot of weight because, well, guys like to show off, one, and two, because it's a great way to produce strength in the pector pectoral major and pectoral minor muscles. I said it last week, just in case you didn't know, I love muscles. I studied exercise physiology in college. So the whole thought of exercise and training and fitness and this grueling process of going from I can't do this to I can do this because I practiced it over and over and over again. And I went through failure over and over and over again. And so eventually I was able to do something that I couldn't do before. I bend it my body in such a way I beat it so that it could do something that it couldn't do before. I love exercise. But with bench pressing, oftentimes when you see guys in the gym and you see two, three, four, five plates, and you see the guy on there and somebody's spotting him or gal, got some, got some beastie women on this earth, right? Some strong women, all right? I'm not going to single anybody out, though they thought they, they thought they were about to get singled out. They looked at me like, no, don't say my name. Got some strong women in this church, but... You see these people under this bench rack and they're about to press 
And, and, and I'm not going to make this the loud sound that they make, but they make this loud guttural sound and they press this bar up and they go for one rep and then they rack it. That would be a way in which you could increase or test your strength. Strength is a one rep thing. Most times we're going for a max or a PR, a personal record. But endurance is different. See, the text is saying it's going to produce endurance, not strength, because endurance is saying that I can do that same exercise, maybe not the same load, but that same exercise, and I'm doing it for repetition. And now how I measure whether I was successful or not is that one day I could do a certain amount of reps, but in the future I could do more. Or one day I could hold the bar above my chest, unracked, and see how long I can hold it. And maybe it was five seconds one day, but the next time it's nine. See, endurance is how long you can do the work, not just that you can do it once. And James uses this word, not being an exercise science grad from IUP, James uses this word and he says, trials, consider them all joy because the testing of your faith produces what? An ability to last longer. An ability to withstand. That's what God is utilizing trials for. Know this, God ain't using them to punish you. It just so happens that every once in a while we're screwing up and then the trial happens. So we might get the impression, oh, God saw my internet search history. And then I started going through stuff at work. So clearly, God's punishing me. Now, see, your internet search history is punishment enough because you're seeing something that's not holy. You're seeing something that draws you away from the Lord. That's punishment enough. And we have to get out of this notion that God's just up there so vindictive, ready to throw lightning bolts at any moment because he sees you. Because then it makes the thought of him seeing you so scary when in fact it's so loving. Because he sees you and he still loves you. Man, that's good. He sees you. Sorry, that's an amen moment. Just, I don't, you don't have to do it for me. But it's truth. Like amen means I agree. That's true. That's good. So if you say it, it ain't for Donovan. But he sees you and still loves you. That shouldn't scare you. But the lie from Satan we get is that he sees me and then these trials happen. And that's not what's happening at all. He's utilizing these trials because he wants, Ned, for your endurance to have, or your faith to have an enduring nature. He knows that he has been giving you grace because of your faith. You've gotten something from him that you do not deserve, because that's essentially what grace is, unmerited favor. You've received a favor that you didn't deserve and you never will deserve. And he gave it to you because you decided to believe in the one you couldn't see. Because you decided to say, I put my confidence on the one I've not personally met, but I know him better than I know anybody else that I have personally met. And he says, Ned, I want that faith to be so enduring that when things go wrong, when things go according, or not according to plan, when things go off script, you'll still trust in me. Your confidence will be fully rested in me. That matters to him. It should matter to all of us. And we talked about last week how he tests precious things, right? I use the example of how he tests steel, or we test steel. And let's see if it actually came through. Give me one second here. Let's see. Okay, we're not gonna get it. Sorry, I text somebody, a content matter expert for something, and I was hoping that the text unread on my phone was that insight. So I'm just gonna give you my understanding. I have a friend that works at a company who tests steel before it's used in the manufacturing projects of military equipment and machines. Before ships are made, before planes are made with steel, they send it to a third party to be verified, inspected, to be certified for tensile strength, for impact, for temperature resistance, because they have to make sure that the steel will withstand the projects that this military equipment is going to engage in, the battle that this military equipment is going to engage in. And so he has a really important job, and so he has to punish this metal to make sure that 
the rest of the metal in the batch is good before they send it. And they put their seal on the metal, indicating that they say this metal will withstand exactly what we promise it will withstand. Now, if the military tests metal before they make tanks, know that God's going to test your faith because your faith anchors everything else about the relationship. Your faith is the only way in Hebrews, we talk about this, that you can please God. It says, without faith, it's impossible to do so. Hebrews 11. And so faith truly matters to God. Your belief and confidence in him truly matters to him. And he wants to make sure you have it even when stuff ain't going so well. It's easy to believe in somebody when they do everything you want. It's easy to believe in somebody when anytime you say, I want this, they give it to you. It's kind of what kids have, immature people have, when maybe your children walk up and say, Mommy, I want candy. And when you give it, you're the most amazing mommy in the world. But the moment you say no, I don't got to make the sound. You know what it sounds like. It sounds like after church every Sunday when those jokers come up from Grace Kids from Club GK and they say, I want a mint. And you say, no, nah, man, you done had three of them. All of a sudden, the relationship's tested. Maybe it's not the kids. Maybe it's some of the adults. Maybe it's some of the husbands in the room. But you get told no. And all of a sudden, it's the relationship's being tested. And I want to make sure that I have a confidence in God that's not just rooted in when God does something I want. When I get the new job, when my health is intact, when my kids are healthy, when we get the bonus, when no one's laid off at our company, when the Eagles crush the Patriots this afternoon. I want a faith that goes beyond those things. Because otherwise, I have a very immature, I want candy, give it to me type of faith. And that does not please the most high God. And he's worthy of more. Amen? So that's your review. Oh, wait, oops. No, 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 no. I made sure I wouldn't forget this. Can we pull up 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18? So I want to read this, and then I'm going to go over something really important about this. So, therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Remember, there's this example that Judah gave a few years ago. You give it every two years or so, I think it comes up, where he talks about, The body and the mind and the spirit. So as we're reading this, I want you to understand that this guy is dying every day. You're another day older. Your knee might hurt just a little bit more than it did a couple days ago. Not speaking that over your life, just saying some of y'all limp when you come in here. So every day we're drawing closer to death. Because we are mortal. When you're younger, you feel immortal. The older you get, you realize, "Mm, not immortal. My knee buckled putting my clothes in the dryer this morning. I have no idea why. I'm not accepting that as a curse. Just means I'm going to go in the gym and hit hamstrings this week. Okay? Because there's preventable ways to fix that. But all the same, my body will sometimes fail. But while this guy is failing, that spirit man... For the one who's pursuing, and that's important, not automatic, but for the one who's pursuing the Lord intentionally, consistently saying, Lord, show me more. Lord, I want to know more about you. That person's being renewed every day, being strengthened every day, being restored every day, being refreshed every day by the truth of who God is. So it's important that ain't automatic. Let's keep reading. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Let's stop there. I referenced that last week but didn't pull up the passage. And I recognize 
that some of you don't feel like your current situations are light and momentary. And I said, doesn't matter if you're going through job loss, doesn't matter if they're downsizing, doesn't matter if your kids are sick, doesn't matter if the home is falling apart or the sink gets ripped out the wall. Yesterday, doesn't matter if you lose a loved one. And when I said that, it's not that it was any less true, but I didn't factor in that not everyone's there. So if anybody was hurt by that, again, doesn't invalidate the truth of scripture, but I want you to understand how sensitive we all need to be when we're up here, that we might not have you all where we want you yet, and this may not feel like light and momentary anything, and it might come off as if I'm being insensitive, but when Paul wrote it and I recited it, no, that it's not that we're saying your situation doesn't matter, but rather what we're saying is compared to the eternal weight of glory of what would it be like when all of sin is eradicated, death is no longer, and I am with the Lord always, no distractions, no barriers with him only, not having to go to work, not having to make money, not having to save anything, and not having to work my hamstring so my knee doesn't buckle. That eternal time, our current circumstance compared to that is light and momentary, and only that. So it's not saying, Lindsay, if you're going through something right now at home, that it doesn't matter to me or to God. In fact, it matters a lot. But when you reflect on what I'm going to have with him in the future, but also, here's the cool part, what I get to have with him right now. Because heaven ain't something I got to wait for a very long time, right? Eternal life in John is said as this, that you would know the Father and Jesus Christ, the one he has sent. So that eternal weight of glory, some aspects of it we won't get until later, but some of them, we get right now, right now. And so when I compare what I'm going through to who I have, man, it's light and momentary. Because, and Paul's really a, a poet here, and, and my brother pointed this out, light, you look down, weight of glory. Interesting word choice. Momentary, you look down, eternal. He is comparing your circumstance, regardless of what it might be, to something very specific. Doesn't mean it doesn't matter. Doesn't mean he doesn't care. Doesn't mean I don't care. What I'm saying is, you have someone who is so great, a relationship that is so amazing, that that relationship, when I take the time to focus on that, more than I do my problems, I have something that is far greater than anything I might ever go through. That's important. If I don't finish anything else today, you must get that. That God has something heavy and long lasting for you. And so the fact that he's trying to make you more enduring is pretty awesome because he's trying to make you as enduring as the eternal weight of glory you have to enjoy now and then. You have something amazing that hopefully takes your focus off of, oh my gosh, work is getting crazy. Oh my gosh, my kids are nuts. I thought them going to school would curb their, their energy level. It hasn't. They're coming home more energetic. I don't know what to do. But I got a God that's so much bigger so much bigger than anything I might be going through. And so I choose to put my focus, my attention on that. Let's read the last verse. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, all the things we're talking about, but the things which are not seen are eternal. This harkens back to week three of Hidden Treasures. If you want to go on YouTube to watch it, we talked about how the believers of old didn't get to see the fulfillment of the promise, but they could look, they could look down the road. And by down the road, I mean hundreds of thousands of years. They could see 
right? That there is a homeland, there is a patria that they're going to be in one day where they're going to be with him. And so nothing else mattered more than that. And their pursuit of this homeland that they wouldn't taste physically in this life drove them to do amazing things, to endure persecution, to believe in him during exile and trial. Because they recognized he was worth it. But on to today. I want to talk to you about how during these trials, it is my personal experience, and maybe some of yours, that during these tests of our faith, during these very difficult moments where I have to make the decision whether I'm going to choose to pursue God or not, that during these times, God gives us a comfort to help us withstand. He's not just saying, Rusty, you need more endurance, so I'm about to test you. He's saying, I want your faith to be more enduring, and these things are going to happen, and I'm not going to spare you from them because I know that it's producing in you an endurance, but I want to comfort you with more of my presence. I want to comfort you with my peace. I want to give you such a peace that it doesn't make sense, as Philippians talks about in four, chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. I want to give you a peace that transcends all understanding. It doesn't make any rational sense that you would have a peace and the kids keep getting sick. That you would have a peace and the cases keep piling up, but you have it. I want to give you that comfort. But I just don't, I, want, I don't want to just give it to Rusty. I want to give it to everybody that Rusty's going to interact with, right? And so there's all these people you come in contact with, and when you talk to them, they might ask you questions like, hey, bro, how are you? And you have a choice. Because in that moment, you could tell them everything that's going wrong. And it's, it's your right, right? Like, we're close. I would hope when I ask you how you're doing, you'd be honest with me like, hey, it's not so great right now. But in the midst of that conversation, you wouldn't just do that, but you would say, this is what I'm relying on, however. This is the truth that I'm clinging on to while all of this is going on. While all of this shaking is happening, this is the firm ground, the sturdy ground I'm standing on. All right? That's what I'm relying on right now, and I know it to be effective. It's what's keeping me. See, because now you go from being comforted by the Lord to saying, hey, I want to comfort others, right? The comfort you received, you're now dispensing. We can't just hold on to the truth of God's word, to the truth of the experiences and encounters we have with him and keep it to ourselves. And no, I don't want you to confuse this with you all becoming evangelists and all signing up to do missions. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the daily conversations we engage in where we like to tell the news and it's always bleak and dark because we think the more details we give, the gorier it is, the more attention we'll get. And we have this sick comfort and saying, hey, look how bad my life is. So difficult. And people going, sending good vibes. Prayer hands. I'm with you on Facebook. We get some kind of sick comfort from that as opposed to saying, Lord, what are you giving me that is stronger and more true and more eternal than any of the circumstances I'm facing? What are you giving me to hold on to? And then when people say, how are you doing, bro? You could say, I ain't that good, but I'm relying on something that's far more enduring than this. This stuff will get tired before God does. So let's talk about it, right? Because again, I'm just making this case that when we're comforted, when we're strengthened, when we have truth, we're to share it. So I want to give you something that might not scream off the page as being such, but I think it's a great example. Can we go to Acts chapter 16? So I'm starting off at verse 25. I highly encourage you to read the whole chapter. For time's sake, we're not going to do that. But this is talking about a moment when Paul... And his brother in arms, Silas, are imprisoned. Teensy bit of context. They're imprisoned because as they're walking about doing their rounds, they see a woman that is demon-possessed, and they do the very heinous, terrible 
ridiculous, disrespectful, inconsiderate thing of casting the demon out. How dare they? They say, hey, you're afflicted. We want to set you free. And the person who owned her, because she happened to be a slave, the person who owned her thought, she's not going to have as much value to me not being afflicted. Again, read the story. It's ridiculous. But they get in prison because of them setting someone free. They get in prison essentially for comforting someone. And while they're in prison, likely beaten, likely hungry, likely next to people who were stinky, likely next to people who were disgruntled, likely next to people who talked like sailors, or maybe other believers, we don't know. We just know they're in prison. They decide that they're going to pray and sing hymns of praise. Now let's talk about what happens with that. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. Again, remember, they're in prison. Anybody been to prison before? Working or otherwise? I know a couple of you guys have worked in a prison before. Yeah. I taught a class there once. It's not great. Just saying, don't go. You don't need a personal experience. Avoid it. Kind of stinks. Betty, I'll tell you really quickly. I remember teaching in a prison during grad school to avoid some papers. And um, in trying to avoid these papers on educational theorists, I was given the opportunity to teach a career readiness class at the Indiana County Prison. And it was a cool experience being able to shed light and encouragement to other people and to help them, you know, maybe prevent going back, right, to curb recidivism rates, which is the rate of return for incarcerated individuals. I wanted to make sure they were as prepared as possible, knowing that the world is not the most inviting place to them, unfortunately. But if they're prepared, right, if they have a character, then maybe just maybe they might choose other things, and maybe this maybe they might have the support they need. And so I'm teaching this class. But when you go in and you go through the sally port, uh, which is like the double doors before you go into the prison, right, they take away your ID, they take away your phone, right? They take away your belt. They take away anything sharp you might have. And so you're essentially going in there hoping that your pants aren't baggy, all right? And you're going in there with nothing that says, I am who I am. No way to communicate with the outside world because they don't want the inmates to be to have access to these things. Nothing sharp because they don't want you to hurt anybody or to be hurt by anybody. And you go into this place, and as you go through the sally port, I lie to you not, every time I went through there, you could feel a coldness, an emptiness, a brokenness in this place. Some of that's intentional because that's how our criminal justice system works, but some of it's just really sad when you walk in there and it's just, you feel the collective weight and heaviness of sin and debauchery and brokenness. Some of the inmates and some of those who wronged them. Who, who set them up in life in such a way where now all of a sudden they're making decisions that they shouldn't be making, but maybe it's because of the trauma the parents inflicted on them or their community inflicted on them, and all the same, now they've inflicted it on other people, and you feel the collective weight of godlessness in that place. Not to say that there's no believers in that place, but you just feel this weightiness, and if you've ever worked there, you may understand what I'm talking about. I just volunteered for a few weeks, and I became very intimate with knowing when I went through that sally port, I was maybe the only one possibly carrying joy into that place. Couldn't say for sure, but it's what it felt like. This is the place that Paul and Silas say, we're going to sing hymns of praise to who? God. We're going to show how enduring our faith is in him. So they start to sing, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. 
Their praise was so consequential to the current circumstance that God said, because he promises where two or more are gathered in my name or where I'm being praised, I'm going to show up. And so they start to praise and God says, let me get myself up in this tight space. Ah. And all of a sudden the prison can't hold God's presence. The prison starts to shake because there's no doors, no walls, no gates that God can't get through, no situation he can't enter if you say, Lord, please come in. And Scott enters the place and the prison doors start to shake and all the chains are unfastened. And let's continue. It then says, when the jailer awoke, because the earthquake might wake you up, and saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is the dude who is inflicting punishment on them. The dude who has to participate in their punishment, not because they did something wrong, but because they upset the establishment, because they set someone free from their bondage. And that wasn't convenient to the people who were profiting on her bondage. And because they do that, because they are faithful to God's work, they get punished. And the man who's punishing them, the first thing he does when he realizes that he's not going to have to lose his life because he lost all the prisoners, he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They took the comfort and truth that they knew of the Lord, and now they get to share it with him. Let's keep going. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus, not do all of these things, not delete your music list on your device, not delete your Instagram and TikTok apps, not break off that relationship, though you probably should, not stop looking at those websites, though you probably should, not like, you know, he, they didn't make this very long and arduous. There's a lot of things we need to change about our lives. There's a lot of things that hinder us from access to the Lord. But they said, if you wish to be saved, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be what? Saved. I'll say it one more time. Y'all weren't with me. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be what? Saved. You and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and his whole household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Sister, brothers, they had a whole church service all because somebody had a confidence in God that endures. Now you say, I don't want to be tested. Tough. In this life, your Savior says you will be. But man, now that we see that other people's lives can be positively impacted by the endurance I now have, maybe just maybe when James says consider it all joy, you won't think he and I for preaching it are nuts. Because you say, you know what? I'm going to consider it all joy because I said that I want to see Jesus Christ made, made known to the world. I said that I want people to know this joy that I have. I just didn't realize that it means that I might have to be crushed a little for it to happen. I didn't know that I might have to be inconvenienced a little bit for it to happen. I didn't know that I would have to endure problems and go through struggles for it to happen. But now that I know that that might be a prerequisite, am I willing? Will I endure? Will I continue to put my confidence in him when it gets difficult? And I hope your answer is a resounding yes. And I hope your response to knowing that this trial is producing this endurance and that other people might be set free, I hope that your response is, it is worth it. Because that's what we need to get to. This isn't just a catchy slide. This isn't just a catchy title. 
This is how we should all, as we mature, sum up our life in this moment. With all the good and all the bad, all the difficult, all the easy, all the problems, all the solutions, it is worth it. He is worth it. I'll go through it with a smile on my face, not because I'm the joker, not because I'm crazy, but because I recognize he is worth it. How does that change you looking at your circumstances now? Doesn't make you think they're easy, because they're not. But compared to the eternal weight of glory, compared to the fact that others might be set free, they were punished for setting somebody free. They're put in prison. The people that punished them thought, good, we've stopped this foolishness. And salut. Because God can't be boxed out by the prisons that this life produces. God can't be boxed out by the physical structures that might be hindering us from getting access. God can't be boxed out by the emotional struggles you're going through, by the mental anguish and depression you're going through, by the hurtful relationships and brokenness of your childhood that you went through. God can't be boxed out. He can get into it. All you got to say is, Lord, plumb, come to me, Lord, save me. Come help me. Come here, God, I need you. You say that, he gets through. No delay. They're in the middle of a prison. The Wi-Fi wasn't good. Better yet, they didn't have any. The Bible app wouldn't have worked in the basement of that prison. But they said, we're going to start singing. And it now changes the whole understanding of what you have about the word praise break. Because you might think that that's some shouting in church, but they broke out of a cell because of their praise. What's your song of break? What's your song of breakthrough? What's the thing of truth you're going to hold on to? Not because it's a magical incantation, because it might be the only thing that helps you endure when everything is going to puts. When everything's breaking down, that one nugget of truth might be the thing that you need only to save you. Not might be, it is the only thing that you need. You think you need all these other things. You think you need all these other conveniences and tools and resources. But at the end of the day, the people we read about, our ancestors in the faith, they had so little compared to what we have. And they were able to do amazing things because they relied on the truth of him. That's it. And you say, I need this. I need this. I need Donovan. If I only had this, I'd be able to walk deeper in my faith. Incorrect. Because there may come a time when we don't have all those conveniences in this country. Right now, I could be at the North Appalachian Folk Festival yesterday with this on my table and have no consequences, but there are places in the world where this Bible could have got me murdered yesterday. And you might take for granted that that's what we have here. That ain't always gonna be a circumstance. Persecution and trials are coming. And you know what? I didn't just promise you that, he did. So it's not just the issues you're going through now. More might come. More difficult situations might come. But I want you to understand, if you hold on to this, even if you don't got the physical book in your possession, but you hold on to the truth you have about him, you will endure. Because he's overcome the world. There ain't nothing in this world that he has not overcome. So that's why I hold on to him. That's why I continue to hike to the top of the mountain because the view is worth it. And that's just a picture of what he can do if I continue to pursue him. He will always show me a view of him that I didn't get if I stayed at the bottom. On the way here this morning, I really wanted to get here earlier. I'm trying to break this whole show up at 9.55 habit that I have. Got here at 9.52 today. So improvement. Not quite where we want to be. Pray for me. But part of the reason why I was not here earlier is I got a text message and the person told me that I can share this. I won't share their name, but the person told me I can share this story. Um, getting back from the house, I drop Felicia off to rehearsal. I empty the car. I sit down for a moment thinking, can I get a chore done quickly? It's usually why I'm late, washing dishes or something. And I see a text message from a friend from college and he says, yo, bro, that's it. Now, in college, we weren't like the greatest of friends. We didn't talk a whole lot. We talked enough. I knew his name. I knew he was a decent guy. 
But we didn't have this deep, long-lasting friendship. Our families don't know each other. Our wives have never met. But we reconnected about a year ago over a podcast that he has. And, and he says to me, yo, bro, that's it. That's all I got, all the context. Yo, bro. And I'm getting ready to read some more to prepare for this morning, thinking last-minute reading won't hurt. I want to make sure I'm filling myself as much with the Lord as possible so that what I come up here to give is him and not me. But something told me, hey, you should probably respond. So quickly I respond, hey, bro, how are you and the family doing? Text comes back right away. Can you talk? It's 8.52. It's super inconvenient. I have not showered yet. I have not picked out a matching shirt with my wife yet. I didn't get to read anything this morning, which is my, my practice. We talk for 23 minutes and he tells me how he feels so alone. How in the last six months, he just got this new job. So he's been promoted at his company. He's doing so well. Him and his wife just closed on the house two weeks ago and they, they got movers like the next day. I've never heard of it being that efficient, but the movers moved them in the next day. Their kids are thriving. Their oldest just started first grade. He's super smart, like super smart. And all things are going well, but he felt alone because the people he cares about most back in his neighborhood he grew up in, which is not like the easiest place to grow up in, a lot of distractions, a lot of trials there, he feels like he's leaving them behind. He felt like he couldn't text his group chat and say that he closed on the house because somebody in his group chat is going through a lot of stuff right now, and he was scared that that might break them, that one more good thing is happening to somebody else and not to them. And so he's like, I can't even share with my friends how I'm doing. And there's a lot of things I want to do, but my friends, they're pulling double and triple shifts so that they can afford to survive. And I'm making all this money and I get to work from home in this comfort. And so they're not available when I want to do certain things. And not for nothing, like I want to go on, on these trips and I'd love for my friends to be there, but they can't afford to go. They can't take off. They may work hourly. And so I just feel so alone. And in a week where I'm supposed to be preaching to you that the truth that you have received from God, you have an obligation to share with others that they might be comforted by the one who has comforted you, I get an inconvenient call where somebody needs comfort. Go figure. And for 23 minutes, because this person doesn't have as familiar a relationship with the Lord as I do, he says, I kind of get why you're religious, but that's not really my jam. I get to share with him why I'm so comforted and why I don't feel alone. And you might think, well, Donovan, you know a lot of people, you talk a lot, so of course you're not alone. But I actually feel quite alone often. Despite all of the multitude of relationships I have, I don't always get to go deep with everybody that I have a relationship with. There's a lot of strangers that know me because I'm an admissions counselor. I give my cell phone out to teenagers I barely know and say, hey, call me about IUP. So a lot of my relationships are transactional. A lot of my relationships are, I got a question about the admissions process. Do I got to turn in SAT scores? Yo, did you get my application? Am I going to get admitted yet? You said seven to 10 days. It's been seven and a half days. You didn't send me my letter yet. So a lot of my relationships aren't as fulfilling as I'd like them to be. And there's often times where I feel very alone. I travel for work. My wife's not there. That's my best friend. Outside of Jesus, it's Fee. So I'm in hotel rooms alone, eating dinner for weeks on end, alone. And so I get what he's talking about, but I've learned that I'm not truly alone. I've learned that no matter what county I travel to, what high school I'm in, no matter how transactional all of these other relationships may be, my relationship with the Lord is not transactional, it's transformative. So I get to talk to this guy who barely knows God, and I get to say, hey, it's kind of ironic that you called me today and that you were looking for comfort and looking for relationship because guess what? I'm preaching on it today and I know somebody you could have comfort with. Now, you may not be ready for us to talk about that yet, but I just want you to know whenever you feel alone, you can hit me up. And it's because I have a confidence that if we continue to talk, he might just make a decision. I'm going to love him regardless of what decision he makes, but he might just make a decision. And so I'll play the long game and I'll endure. And there's going to be moments where he gets on my nerves. There's going to be moments where he might even reject what I believe in. But I'm going to endure because God has built in me over trial, a faith that endures, a perseverance, a character, a hope that won't disappoint. So I'm going to continue to pursue him because God pursued me. 
And it's my hope that one day we'll be to laugh about this moment where he felt alone and then recognize he was never alone. And so an interruption, an inconvenience, a difficulty, a trial, a challenge, a thing that hinders the scheduled plan might be the very thing God is using to strengthen your faith and to make alive a faith in someone else. So if you're going to be a comforter, if that's the spiritual calling you have on your life, and I'm here to tell you, don't make it so mysterious and deep, it is. If you're his, it is. You may not be called to MC or to preach, may not be called to Grace Kids, although Ms. Pat will tell you all of you are called to Grace Kids, so you better sign up for y'all get in trouble. But you may not have a specific calling that someone else has, but all of you are expected, obligated to share the comfort you have received. And what's comfort? Well, comfort is truth proven by personal experience with the Lord. If you're writing notes, comfort is truth that I have that I know is true because of a personal encounter with the Lord. Something that only results from pursuit. You are obligated, sis, that when you gain truth, you give it. We don't sit on the truth we have received. We share this good news, these glad tidings. We share it because there is a world out there that is yearning for it. And you play a role not just by signing up to do missions in some foreign country, though that's needed, not just to go to some poor neighborhood in Philadelphia and serve sandwiches, because that's needed, but I mean in the daily conversations, we have a choice of what we share with people. And you might have been sharing the CNN news, the Fox news, the local channel news. You might have been sharing all the negative highlights about your life because that's more captivating to people, but I encourage you, to move on from that and share the truth, the good news, the glad tidings, the things that are keeping you sane in a time that is insane, the things that are keeping you steady in a time that is shaking, I encourage you to share that and to not be scared or nervous to do so. Because someone was brave enough to do that for you, despite how uncomfortable it may have been. Someone said, let me share this nugget of truth and you were set free. Your prison doors were open. So I encourage you, by saying now it's your turn to open some prison doors. Because you'll find that just like that hike, it's worth it. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you, God, for I thank you, God, for providing your word. Lord, if there was anything that I said that was unnecessary or distracting. God, I pray that you would cause everybody in the room to forget it and that they would only hold on to what you have for them individually. God, you wish to speak to every single person in this room and every person watching on Facebook or YouTube, you seek to speak to them and to have a deeper, more personal relationship. Lord, some of them may be going through trials that are causing them to consider not pursuing you any longer. But Lord, I pray that you would put deep down in their spirit a confident resounding, it is worth it so that they might continue. Lord, comfort them in your truth. Comfort them in your presence. Comfort them in your peace because God, I don't wish for them to fall away. God, I want them to be people that are good soil, that seed will germinate and produce fruit in. I want them to be bountiful, providing a harvest unto you for your glory of people that they share the good news with, people that come to believe in you, God. I want them to be comforters, people that are orchestrating, people having stronger faith, more enduring faith because of the truth they share. God, I want your people to be bold, but it starts, Lord, with them recognizing that you have given them all they need, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives, Lord. I thank you for those who are just now learning of you and those who have been walking with you a long time, Lord. I thank you that you are setting our prison doors free and that you're willing to enter into our messy situations. That we're never too dirty for you, God. I thank you, Lord, that you love us so, so much. 
God, help us to show our great love for you in that we pursue. You are always worth it, God. I pray that everyone in the room knows it. It is in your name I pray. The name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.